Hickman cutting applies to the passage that we're studying. But first, let's read the passage. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm going to read that entire chapter after opening up with some more prayer. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. God, thank you for the very meticulous and organized way that you have uh, ordained life to be for us. Setting in, setting in process steps like this where even a diamond cannot be sharpened or cut unless done so by another diamond. Father, thank you for the words that you give us in Scripture. Thank you for the teaching that you provide us through Paul as the apostle in the New Testament in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Cause our hearts and our minds to be open to the things that you would have us learn this morning and then to be taking them and applying them through your spirit, applying them to our lives throughout the rest of the week. Father, we pray these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Again, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Let's read verses 1 through 12. Chapter 1. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Verse 6, seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you, and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord. Last week, last week we looked at verse 3 of this chapter, chapter 1, verse 3. We are bound to thank God always for your brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Amazing in this verse was how very encouraged Paul was for the faith and the charity or love that was growing exceedingly, aboundingly in the Thessalonians in the midst of their continued struggle with sin, which we talked about we would learn in chapter 3 of this book. In the very midst of their struggle, their continued struggle with sin. As well, this practice of publicly offering God praise for the good work that he was doing in their lives before addressing their sin, this practice of, of addressing the good that God was doing in their lives before addressing the sin helped to prepare them for when he would be addressing their sin and proved to be an example for us, an example for us of one who is not merely interested in focusing on behavior, not merely interested in focusing on behavior, either good or bad, but on the overall intention of God the Father, which is conformity of the Thessalonians into the image of Jesus Christ. We also saw by Paul's use of bound and as it is meet, in that third verse, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, that Paul was indicating that even above his own personal desire to thank God, even above that was the fact that God was due this thanksgiving. Even above the idea that Paul was personally uh, thanking God, even above his personal desire to thank God was the reality that God was due this thanksgiving, worthy of thanksgiving and praise in every circumstance, just like Paul had written to the Thessalonians in his first letter to them. In chapter 5, verse 18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 
Lastly, we learned that another reason Paul was so excited about these changes, these areas of growth in the Thessalonians, was because these were the very things he had been praying for them about. These were some of the very things that Paul was praying for them about in 1 Thessalonians. So like you and I are regularly exhorted to do, Paul prayed according to the will, the very will of God. Paul prayed according to the very will of God that his brothers and sisters would grow in the fruit of the Spirit and that they would be being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth. Verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. 5 and 6. Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and your faith, in all your persecutions, and all your tribulations. Persecutions and tribulations. They had been a regular part of the Thessalonian body ever since its inception as a church. A regular, normal, customary part of their everyday life ever since the church began ever since it was formed there in Thessalonica. I shared last week that one of the reasons why Paul was writing to them again was because of the concern that he had that he would later address in them of being irresponsible, living idle lives, kind of mooching off of one another, living irresponsible, something he had already addressed in the first letter and something he had already brought up to them six months before the first letter when he was there in person talking with them, with Silas and Timothy. So there was at least a specific group among them that was struggling with this kind of idleness or laziness. But the body was also continuing to struggle with having a clear understanding, continuing to struggle with having a clear understanding of the coming of Jesus Christ, his return, which served as another reason for Paul to be writing them. In fact, there had even been a letter there had been a letter presented to the Thessalonian body after Paul's initial letter to them. After Paul's initial letter to the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, there had been another letter presented to the Thessalonians that was allegedly also written to them by Paul. Falsely purporting that the day of the Lord had already come. It was a false letter allegedly supposed to have come from Paul, but it hadn't. Falsely purporting that the day of the Lord had already come and fostering an increased sense of hopelessness in the church. Their faith was strong, their charity was strong, love toward one another was strong, and yet they were struggling with this sense of hopelessness that had to do with the coming of the Lord, in part because of this false letter that they received. Thus, Paul also intended in this letter to once again set the record straight regarding the day of the Lord, which he does. Yet what Paul found so extraordinary was that in the midst of this, this growing hopelessness that was kind of going on in the body, in the midst of their persecutions, in the midst of their tribulations, they continued demonstrating this enduring patience and steadfast faith. A faith which can be defined as a spirit of calm submission. Calm submission to the providence of God. Amidst their persecutions, amidst the tribulations, even amidst the idleness that was growing inside, even amidst some of the hopelessness that was going on because they were being told that the day of the Lord had already come, even amidst all of that, they continued to have this enduring patience and steadfast faith, a spirit of calm submission to the providence God. And it was striking how well this body of believers continued to respond to being persecuted, not in fear, not in unrest or turmoil, not with a growing or not with insurmounting doubts as to their salvation, but with steadfast endurance and patience and, and this ongoing faith in God our Father and 
the Lord Jesus Christ, patient and faithful amidst all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Paul indicated that it was for this reason, this reason, this, this patience and faith that he and Silas and Timothy, that they gloried in them. Gloried in them in the churches of God. This phrase, gloried in them, can be a little problematic for us. If you're familiar a little bit with what Paul wrote to the Galatians a couple years earlier than this, probably about two years earlier, and this phrase is a little problematic. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. We'll start reading at verse 12. Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. Galatians chapter 6, verse 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Paul's writing here in Galatians. He's writing, he's writing to the church of, at, at Galatia a couple years before the Thessalonians. He's writing about false teachers. False teachers who are, who are insisting that the men of the church need to be circumcised in order to really understand and benefit from the gospel of grace. Okay? That, that teaching them in reality a false gospel of grace, a gospel of law, which isn't really any gospel at all. Right? Paul is calling them on the carpet in this letter. He's calling them on the carpet, explaining that those false teachers did not come with pure motives. They didn't come with pure motives, but rather they came with some kind of a, a really selfish and ill intent to avoid being persecuted themselves. To avoid being persecuted themselves and to take personal credit for distracting the Galatians and getting the Galatians to buy into their own false theology. By doing so, if these false teachers were to be successful at drawing these Galatians away into some kind of a false theology that required circumcision or any kind of focus on the law, then they themselves would have been able, then the false teachers would have been able to glory in their flesh. This is what we've accomplished, boasting about how many people they got to follow them. Verse 13 there in Galatians, For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. Verse 14, But God forbid, this is Paul, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. If Paul is making such a firm stand to the Galatians to not glory in anything but the cross, to not glory in man, then what's he doing telling the Thessalonians that that's exactly what he's doing? Glorying in man. Galatians 6.14, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you. If Paul's making such a firm stand to the Galatians not to be glorying in man, but to only be glorying in the cross of Jesus Christ, then what's he doing in, first, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, telling them that he himself is glorying in them? <laughs> because what Paul is really glorying in regarding the Thessalonian people, the church in Thessalonica, is not them. He's not really glorying in them, in their flesh, but it's the work that the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished and is accomplishing within them. 
He, he's not contradicting himself. He's not in contrast to, but being consistent with his letter to the Galatians. He is still boasting and glorying only in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the fruit that has come about only as a result of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you do that you endure. Paul knew that faith and patience, enduring faith and patience among tribulations and persecutions can only come about by being grown inside of the church as a result of the Lord Jesus Christ and the cross on which he suffered and the Holy Spirit which now lived inside of him. Were the Thessalonians failing to respond to persecutions and tribulations with, with this patience and faith? Have they been failing to respond to persecutions and tribulations with this kind of patience and faith? Paul wouldn't have had the opportunity to glory in this work that God was doing. The church would not have been an example of God's grace. It wouldn't have been an example of God's grace to other believers. It wouldn't have been an example of God's grace to those outside of the church. The Thessalonians wouldn't, the Thessalonians wouldn't have understood for themselves that this kind of peace that God can offer in the midst of such difficulties. It was their Christ-like response. It was their Christ-like response that God used as an example to encourage and exhort Paul and other believers all over the place. Their Christ-like response. Had they not responded in such a way, what, encouraging, what encouragement would their actions have been? When you're out in the world, when I'm out in the world, well, when we're with each other. How are we responding? Are we responding in a way like the Thessalonians are? are we responding in a way that would bring encouragement or concerned about the way that our actions might impact the church and might impact those outside of the church? Are we concerned about that? Inside the church, are we responding to one another with grace and mercy, peace, gentleness? Are we critical? judgmental, self-righteous in one way or another. And the ability the Thessalonians had to be used by God in this way to offer such great encouragement and exhortation to others within the body of Christ, to those outside the body of Christ, to you and me today, this ability could only come about as a result of their Christ-like response to these tribulations and persecutions. But not only their response. Understand <laughs> that the very presence of these tribulations and persecutions had to be going on in the church. All right, think about that. In order for them to be able to respond to such persecutions and tribulations in a Christ-like manner, they had to first be living through and experiencing and enduring persecutions and tribulations. Had they not even had persecutions and tribulations <laughs> no one would ever have been able to be encouraged again by their Christ-like response because they wouldn't have had anything to respond to. They would have rather been living in some kind of a fictional utopia where life was easy, void of any kind of need to mature. In the world's economy, This kind of utopia, this kind of fictional utopia existed in the world. It would be the most, most sought-after place on the planet, right? <laughs> no hardships, no difficulties, no challenges, no reason for change or growth, no need for maturing, no need to endure anything. The world sometimes lives with this kind of self-entitlement, believing that it, it deserves this kind of, this kind of, kind of utopic atmosphere. Around. I may have shared with you at another time that I used to work for an employment agency, and we partnered with the Department of Welfare, teaching people how to find jobs. And 
you know, classes anywhere from five to 15, sometimes more, sometimes a little less, people who had, who had entered welfare and were receiving some kind of financial assistance and yet needed to find a job at the same time. And so they would come through our program, we would teach them how to find jobs and follow them up for maybe a year afterwards to make sure that things were going well for them. And most people that came through the program had at least a general understanding that, you know what, I may not really feel like working, I don't wanna work all the time, but I know I need to find something and I know I can't stay in this condition forever. So, so I, I, I know I'm here, I need to be. But there was one individual in a particular class who kind of had this idea of a utopia. She wanted to be taken care of, and she believed that she was entitled to it. And the statement that she made in the middle of one of the classes was, she stood up and she said, I am a United States citizen. I deserve to be paid. Right. And I'm not sharing that with you so that we could judge that kind of, because we can all fall into places of, <laughs> can all fall into places of confusion, right? But the reality is, is that the world makes demands on all situations around them, people in their lives, work, family, friends, acquaintances, in order to get closer to this kind of carefree living, making demands on others, or working, striving hard enough, as, as though if they could work hard enough, if they could orchestrate and change enough policies or manipulate the people around them in the workplace, that they could somehow attain to and acquire some kind of, some kind of a utopia somehow, or maybe prepare themselves so that one day after I've worked hard enough, I can sit back and relax and just enjoy life and never have to worry about any other problems or burdens, change, struggle, utopia. To the world, there is great value in easy living, and unfortunately, we as believers often find ourselves in the same trap, seeking easy lifestyles, void of any kind of family issues, workplace problems, relational difficulties outside or inside the church, becoming angry when things aren't going our way. Why am I being tested this way? Why are they doing this to me? Why does it have to be that their decisions impact me too easily, friends. We let this world's economy from which we've been rescued, too often we let the world's economy become our economy. We walk around disgusted at those around us who, make, who we perceive making our lives difficult, miserable, it's at those times when we need to remember that our economy is not the economy by which we ought to be governed, but rather God's economy. And God's economy is very different than ours. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25 tells us that the foolishness of God, if there could be a foolishness of God, the foolishness of God is wiser than than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Even in our greatest wisdom in determining how life should be orchestrated and governed around us, even in our greatest wisdom, we are responding to life making decisions in great foolishness. God's economy is very different, higher than our own. It was, this, this happens sometimes, and it always amazes me in Ron's Sunday School class this morning, how God orchestrated a sermon, how God orchestrated God, uh, Ron's message this morning as he was teaching. <laughs> this is one of the phrases that he mentioned this morning. God may want our endurance more than our deliverance. God may want our endurance more than our deliverance. The world... Give me deliverance. Often we, no, just give me deliverance. But God may want our endurance, and he often does, more than our deliverance. In God's economy, he has a great focus on doing and allowing whatever it takes to make us become more like Jesus Christ. 
more like our Savior. And he will use all circumstances in our lives to that end. As with the Thessalonians, whose ongoing persecutions and tribulations were being used by God to produce this patience and increased faith, and therefore were found by God, the persecution and the tribulations, were found by God to be highly valuable tools, useful for their equipping, useful for their transformation into the image of Christ. God may want our endurance more than our deliverance. Many times these trials, opportunities to grow, are presented to us from those outside the church, as was happening here with the Thessalonians. Yet sometimes it's the hurts and offenses that we receive from one another, either, either in the extended body of Christ or maybe even here in this local expression of Christ. <laughs> Uh, that really make responding in the Spirit hard. We expect offenses from the world. They can't and they aren't expected to treat us with some kind of love. They're never commanded to. In, they're not commanded to in Scripture. They can't do it. They're not able to. They're still living in that sinful nature that has control over their minds, their body, everything about them. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, children of the same heavenly Father, actually parts of the same body, it is we who have often the greater ability to cause deeper wounds in one another. And in our flesh, we often want to react with greater frustration and despair. Yet God's usefulness, God's usefulness of even these offenses shows his consistency in using all things to bring us into greater and deeper intimacy with God, with himself, conformity, opportunities to abide in Christ. In the video we watched, we heard that only a diamond is hard enough to cut another diamond. Two stones, a primary and a secondary, are used to shape each other. Even the grinding wheels are encrusted with a fine diamond grit needed to polish the surface of a facet. Listen to this excerpt by Miles J. Stanford. His book called None But the Hungry Heart, it's on page six. He lays it out there for us and, and gives us some insight into what it really means, what it takes sometimes for you and I to be made Christ-like. Listen to this. You are one of God's rough diamonds. That's nice. You are one of God's rough diamonds, and he is going to have to cut you so that you may really shine for him. It takes a diamond to cut a diamond. You are to be ground and cut and hurt by other diamonds, by other Christians, by spiritual Christians. But the more cutting and the more perfecting, the more you are going to shine for your Lord. You see, in God's economy, our persecutions, our tribulations, our hurts, our difficulties, our hardships, calls from events outside the church, inside the church, they have significant value and purpose. They are used by God to refine us, strengthen and equip us, used by God to humble us. Something else Ron mentioned this morning used by God to show us the powerlessness of our own flesh, to cut out that flesh and its vices out of our lives. To remind us of his own almighty power to grow inside of us his fruit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Hmm. This week I received a testimony from a sister in Christ who 
who emails from time to time and says that she watches the videos of the sermons. This is what she wrote this past week. Yesterday, I felt led to pray for grace and any slights that might be felt. Funny. I felt one, and my new reaction is to seek to learn what the Lord may want to teach me at those times. I guess the new thing is that rather than trying to pray or work it away, is to realize that I sometimes can do neither. And I take peace in that only He can do the work in me. This person's finding value Value in persecutions and tribulations, difficulties, hardships, rough times. Value. Realizing that the only thing she can do is take peace and that only he can do the work in her. Jesus Christ, God, the Father, the Holy Spirit, is actively at work in every one of us, demonstrating ongoing reasons for us to be glorying in the cross of Jesus Christ, thanking him, praising him, abiding in him, agreeing with him in the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in and through us, not running away, from the challenges and frustrations that come up. Because of his work, it's when you're in the midst of really grappling and really struggling, really being burdened by some kind of a personal slight or offense that's really hitting home, hurt feelings, frustrations, maybe persecutions, tribulations that you might be facing. It's in the midst of these times when we need to remember and appreciate with sincere gratitude and thanksgiving That God is intentionally using, intentionally using that very situation in your life, intentionally wanting to cut out the vices, selfishness, entitlement, judgmentalism, fear, all these things that the flesh holds on to. Cut them out of your life in order to make you more like our gracious and loving, merciful, compassionate Savior. Our old nature has been done away with. We have a new nature living inside of us because of Jesus Christ resurrecting from the dead. Let's live and walk in the Holy Spirit according to that new nature that he has so blessed us with. Father God, thank you for that new nature that you've given us. In our own foolishness, in the error of our ways, we look at something like a fictional or false utopia as something that we need to strive for. We need to make it so that we can live in some kind of a world that doesn't have, here on earth, that doesn't have any kind of, of struggle. We don't need to mature. We don't need to grow. We don't need to do anything but what we feel like doing and what feels good. Father, remind us that even though that's what the flesh says, and even though that's in line with the old nature that we used to have living inside of us and reigning over us, that that is not what is good, and that is not what is helpful, and that is not what is part of the system of love that you have put in place through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us, Father, in every area and every aspect of our lives to stop looking at the struggles and the the frustrations and the persecutions, tribulations, difficulties, hurts that come our way, to stop running and fleeing from them so much. Stop stop, um, Stop becoming angry at those things for having me. But Father, to begin recognizing your economy and looking at those things and saying, okay, what can I learn from them? What what do you have to show me in this? How do you want to grow me? And what fruit do you want to grow out of these struggles that I'm facing? And how much more do you want me to be abiding in you and focusing on your son, Jesus Christ? And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.